stand as we begin our service this morning. Psalms 32, verses 6 through 8. Let's begin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great water they shall not come nigh unto him. For thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. I will guide hallelujah with my eye. Father, we thank you today. I thank you that you're not hiding. In an hour like this, we call on a God who is more nearer than never before. And I thank you that the comfort abides in within us and gives us connection with you. In order for us to be able to communicate on our phones, we have to pay a bill and keep the connection. Father, I thank you, Lord. Our connection with you is intact. You hear us and know everything about us. And as we gather here today to worship you, Father, as we gather here today to praise your name, as we gather here today, Lord, seeking your holiness, I pray that you would speak to us as sons and daughters, minister to your people, those that are gathered with us through social media and any other outlet. Father, I pray that your grace would permeate through this place and every song, Lord. Let the preach word of God permeate the hearts of a man and a woman, a boy and a girl, and let someone no longer hold on, but let them come now in an acceptable time and surrender their heart to the God who can control and move and operate in their life and guide them as the psalmist told us this morning with your eye. We need your guidance today, Lord. Some of us are standing at the door of the secret, Lord, and we don't want to go outside of your will. We don't want to do anything, Lord, that will pull us away from you, but draw us closer. Somebody hold me closer today. Draw me closer today than I ever been before, Lord. Many are falling by the wayside, but I want to go closer. I want to know you deeper and more richer and intimate, Lord. Have your way in this place. Speak to us and we'll give you the praise. And we'll give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands and to celebrate the Lord. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. How many come and give God some praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
on Sundays, we are here at 1030 in service, sharing in worship and song. We believe it's in order that we have a time of worship coming together. The Bible says to say now to assemble yourselves and come together and, and, and exhort one another as we see the day approaching. That day the Lord will return for his church. So we gather here every Sunday at 1030. And uh, Monday night we have our Zoom meeting. Now, I want to ask you, think of this question because I'm asking on, on, on tomorrow night. Why did the Lord ask Peter, do you love me? Brother Albert messed me all up this morning. Why did the Lord ask Peter, why do you, do you love me? What was going on in that context? That uh, think on it, see me tomorrow night, let's talk about it a little bit. Why did the Lord ask Peter, he asked him three times, do you love me? Very good question. I believe worthy of some thought. So give it some thought. Join me tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Zoom, and we're going to discuss it. Wednesday night, Wednesday night. I can't wait to get to Wednesday night. I might wear some boots on Wednesday night. Oh, God, man, I tell you, I see the Lord. Jesus healed this blind man. I talked about it last week. He took an unpopular method, and he used it to bring a miracle in this man's life. And then he was able to see. And we notice from his conversation with the Pharisees, uh, he was able to see more than just vision. Spiritual vision was in him. God opened his eyes in more ways than one. And he saw the Lord. Remember Isaiah said that he the king of Zion died. I saw the Lord. Turn this down just a little bit, honey. I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. Thank you. That's great. He saw him. He saw him for who he is. And it was a blessing. It's good. The Bible said, bless all the pure in heart for they shall see God. And how many people are walking this earth today and they can't see it? They cannot see God. They can't see God in anything. I never forget one time I was under a ministry. I just got saved and I used to play in a band, those of you who know my story, and uh, we had a lot of good connections, and uh, we were dropping off a tape. I was with the pastor I was under at the time, and he had a radio broadcast, uh, the AOC, I right hear. He was dropping off a tape uh, to play on the broadcast, and when we walked in, I was shocked to see a familiar face, a man who, uh, he was the communications director at that time at Flagler Hospital, and uh, he, he used to hire our band and play. Boy, we made good money when we played for him. And uh, he saw me, and time I walked in, he hadn't seen me since God touched me and changed my life. And immediately, he said, man, I've been trying to find you. He said, I got a date for you. That meant he was going to book our band for a date, but I can make good money. You know what I told him? I said, I don't do that no more. I'm saved. And boy, you should see his response. He said, I'm saved? What is that? I said, God saved me. And then he said, who is God? I don't know who God wow. Me and my pastor, man, I listened listen because I had to hush and I was new in faith. So my pastor had to kick in and start talking to him and telling him about God. You know, the one that woke me up this morning, he said, I didn't, nobody woke me up. I woke up on my own. Wow. He was lost. Okay. He was lost. My heart grieved for him, but I can think of when I was where he was. Mm -hmm. Until God opened my eyes. I wasn't able to see that it was God that woke me up. I like the way the Bible put it. It's in him we move and live and have our being. I had to get saved to understand that. I thought I got up on my own just like he did. I thought when I moved it's on my own. I didn't know that when I do this, it was God. I didn't know when I take this breath of air, it's God. He's all over me, keeping me alive. And I thank him. Thank you for covering me when I didn't know you. But now that I can see you, I see you for who you are. I know what you said is true. That man, when he saw the Lord, he said, Lord, I believe. Man, you got to come, come, come. We're closing out. If you ain't able to come join us, it'll be on uh, streaming live. But I see the Lord. And yet there was religious people, Jesus is going to show you in the scripture in John chapter 9, that were blind, even though they had 20-20 vision to read the Torah, know the law to the letter, they were too blinded by religion to see the Lord standing right in front of them. I don't want to get so stuck in religion, I can't see the Lord. Stuck right in my methods. And religion can box you in. But isn't it like the Lord to take you to an unpopular method? 
so that he could see him in a different light. Because, you know, before, he just told a man, because of your faith, you can see. Others, he told them, go. Wash. You'll be made whole. But he took an unpopular method and showed that he can still work in it. So come on, join us there. On Friday night, we'll be here praying, having a time of prayer and worship. Uh, I can't stir. I don't know what's, what's more important than church, uh, and time in church and praying. These are terrible times. We need prayer. We have children. It's got to live in this world. and You know you'll be long gone, and they have to face some very challenging times. We need all the prayer we can get. Young people, you're living under the guise of spiritual parents who love you and love the Lord. Uh, don't take that for granted. It's God's grace that has afforded you the home you live in with the parents you have and the life you've been able to live. There are some children right here, even in America, who are glad to trade places with you. Yeah. There's a very young lady here that lived in another country. If you sit down and talk with her, and tell me, if she tell you what life is like in the country she was raised in, and what she see happening that already happened over there, trying to happen here, there's a reason we ought to be praying and get on board. There's a reason we ought to be. We're living in those times. I want to take time. Men's ministry. Thank you. I keep trying to forget that. Don't I? Thank you, Mariah. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, the doctor will be in charge. We will be here men's ministry kicking up. I'm looking forward to it, so please come and support him next Sunday at 5 o'clock, and uh, you will be blessed. Wednesday night, I ask if anyone have any prayer requests, any opportunity that we as a church body could come together and pray. And I want to do the same thing today. If I believe in the power of prayer, I believe as a man of faith, that we call upon God to do those things for us we cannot do for ourselves. We call upon Him to move in the lives of people we care near and dear about. Situations that are bigger than us, we must call upon Him. You don't pray, you're saying, God, I don't need you in this, I got it. And God, He's not going to invade your territory. But when you pray and call on Him, God hears, He knows. Anybody in here that have a need of your own, you don't have to say it with us. Just lift your hand. You have a need of your own that you really need God to move in. Who got a loved one here? You would love to see God save and deliver. Anybody strung out on drugs? I know people that are hurting. Hurting through that. Who had to take tests? You're waiting on the doctor results. I know Mariah mentioned her friend you know, is having a situation health wise. So many people are coming up with disease that can't be changed. This virus is still going around. Very much real. Somebody told my wife the other day, you didn't think it was real. Whether you met somebody that, that, that can tell you it's, it's real. Not to take life in. It's by God's grace though. We've made it this far and it's only by His grace we continue. We need Him in this hour. Our world system has failed. By design, it cannot produce a healthy America. By design, it is, it is crumbling. And we need to stay focused. We need at this hour to be steadfast and unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. So as we pray softly, then pray. As we think on these situations, as we look to heaven and trust God with our brokenness, a broken heart, broken relationships, broken dreams, shattered trust, areas of our life that are difficult to go there. But thank you that you are a present help, even in the time of trouble. Pass us not. What you will say. While those others now are calling, do not pass me by. Gently say, yeah, we'll say.
as we live in this hour, perform your awesome work in the lives of your people. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. We'll give you the glory and the honor. In the matchless name that is above every name, the name by which demons tremble, the name that is above every name, somebody say in Jesus' name. Amen. I will direct you now to the music ministry, Michael and Marcus Wilde.
certainly developed this skill, haven't you? Amen. It's a blessing. It's a joy. Amen. We appreciate it. Let's give God a hand praise. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Our sweet silence. Praise the Lord. Well, we, we, we embarked upon this sermon series, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Last week we saw the example was laid before them for a consistent amount of time. And, 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 and even though they saw it all the while, there's some that refused to see it. And yet when the time came, it was too late. When they saw the need to go in the ark, they couldn't. Even though they saw it all the while, when we saw something, the Lord helped me to see. Noah was consistent. Generations. The Bible said David served the gen his generation. Noah generations. Now, I'm very particular about words and letters. Generations, they, they, that's not going to show up here in time. This is in year after year after year after year. Double in 600. They saw it. Well, what must I do to be saved? You must come now. You can't wait. You must come now. Stand with me. The reading of God's word, Romans chapter 13, verse 11. You must say it with me. You must come now. Look at somebody tell them, no way. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Father, I pray that you would help someone that is playing with this decision to come to the realization that now is the time. Now is the acceptable year. And now they must plead the cause. And I pray, Father, that your grace, your amazing grace, would touch that you would, Father, bless us today. Give us ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to be at. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God bless you. The Apostle Paul doesn't waste words. Knowing the time that now, somebody say now. Now, now right now. Now. There's no put off. There's no procrastinating. Now. One thing here lately I've just been talking about is how uncertain life is. The certainty of uncertainty in life is certainly before us as we do not know who next funeral we're going to. We do not know. We know we're going to one sooner or later. I'm like you. I'm not in a hurry to go to one. I heard a pastor say I'm tired of going to funerals. But he still came to the next one. Wow, we have to, we have to deal with it. Paul said, now is the time. I have met so many people who have wasted time, who think they have a lot of time, who play games with time. Young people have no sense of time. And your mom and dad say, amen. Time is something we feel we have a lot of. When really, in all actuality, you do not know. Time is now and high it is to wake out of. He used an interesting word there, sleep. <coughs> not sleep in the sense that you think of it. Sleep in the sense that you are carelessly walking out of the religious covering you need. Maybe I shouldn't use the word religious, but blood covering. You need to be covered. It's time to come out of that sleep. Listen to me. Please don't doze off and look at your phone. Don't go out loud and don't be. Listen to me today. This is life and death. This is the urgency by which I will lose sleep tonight. Thinking about each and every one of us. Notice I didn't say you. I said each and every one of us. This is our time. Come out of this slumber. Come out of this sleep. Come out of this procrastination like we have all kind of time. You do not. Now is our salvation. To use the word is bigger than when we believe. I want to direct you to a passage that helps us better grasp and understand just how important and near it was. And many didn't know Peter 2 and 6. 
talks about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah being turned into ashes. An overthrow was coming. They didn't know it. God made them an example of those that after should live, say it with me, ungodly. He delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Verse 8 says, For the righteous man, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing. Don't we get enough of that now, y'all? Mm -hmm. Seeing and hearing. Bad enough, you got to see it. Worse, you got to hear it. Some things we wish we could just not see and some things just not hear. He's dwelling among them and he's seeing and hearing what they're saying. That's his righteous son. Now, the New Testament tells us this about life. A righteous soul living in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. From day to day, watching their unlawful deeds. Look at the verse Peter gives us the assurance. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. This is a teaching moment. If ever there was one. In a teaching moment, you have an opportunity to learn. Say learn. Learn. This is a teaching moment. You learn how to drive. You had those teaching moments before you just got behind the wheel. And even though you were antsy and ready to go, we had to stop and teach you what the brake pedal was, where the steering wheel was, how to crank the car up, and what to do when you put it in gear. It was a teaching moment. And because you were eager to get achieved to the point to want to drive, you paid attention to that teaching moment. Well, here's a teaching moment I don't want you to miss. I was saying Romans 15 and 4, whatsoever things were written before time, it was written for our learning. Watch this verse. It was written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Boy, don't we need hope in this day. There's no joy living in a society that is evolved as ours. And yet we must live regardless of what they're doing, don't we? You get tired of whatever, but you still have to live in it. Lot was used as a reminder that God delivers. Peter goes to task using this preacher as an opportunity of hope for those he is ministering to and now draws us into this hope as well. For this man on the other side of the cross, the Bible deemed him as righteous. His history goes back to a great lineage. His father <coughs> was taken out of his life, and his uncle Abraham um, took him in. Abraham was a blessing to Lot. And someone that would take him in who was a friend with God. The Bible said Genesis 12 and 1. Lord told Abel, get out your country, go. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you. So look who this young man is with. He's with someone that is blessed. You're better off with someone that's a friend of God. <coughs> the Bible is saying, Genesis 12 and 4, when Abraham left, Lot went with him. Abraham departed at 70 and 5 year old. He embarks on a journey of faith. And God is going to bless him in a land unfamiliar to him. It's one thing to be with someone uh, that's connected. And as a result of that relationship, you enjoy that connection. Amen? I've been there, you know, uh, because I was with someone that knew someone. I didn't know the person they knew, but because I knew them, I was able to reap the benefit of being connected. Favor ain't there, but it's good. Amen? And sometimes just knowing the right person, being connected, can get you somewhere, can't it? It's a good connection, my God. He don't know the Lord, but he's got Abraham. And Abraham know the Lord to the point the Lord is moving him from place to place. The best time Lot has ever had in his life is walking with someone that's walking with God. The best life you can enjoy. He's growing in his faith. The next time his name is mentioned, the language is quite interesting, though, because even though uh, Abraham is growing in his faith a uh, lot, there seems to be a disconnection in their relationship. He ends up in Egypt. 
We should have learned there in Egypt, but the Bible said Abram got out of Egypt and Lot with him. He went into the south in Genesis chapter 13. They went down into the south. And he's traveling because remember this man is on the move. But he's growing in his faith. It was there in Egypt he lied concerning his wife because he was afraid that the beauty of this woman would cause them to want to take her and make her into Pharaoh's court of women. And to justify the conscience they would kill the husband of the wife in order to take her. So he talked her into going in agreement with him and say, you are my sister. Half truth. Well, a lie is a lie. There's no such thing as a half of the truth. You either tell the truth or you put a pin in that young people. Lot goes with Abraham and in verse 5. They had herds, herds, flocks. They begin to flourish, but they can't stick around together. The land was not able to bear them, and now I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. The disconnect comes not from the state that they were together in all of this immense blessing has come, but it's there together, and they're there together with all this immense blessing. And one don't know how to respect the other. And the problem was not on Abraham, it was on Lot. To the point they start a, a strife. What a disconnect. But Abraham is smart. Abraham is not going to tolerate it. In verse 7 of Genesis chapter 13, the Bible says there's strife, actually contention between Abraham's herdmen and the herdmen of Lot. And, 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 and the, the world was watching. That would have been the Canaanite, the Perthazite, dwell there in the land, watching church folk don't get along. Watching church folk who's supposed to get along, not get along. It's sad when the police got to come to church and break up the fight. It's sad when we got to get armed security to help the pastor get out the door because deep down promise to bust a cat. All right. Church folks can't get along. YouTube blowing up with church mess. Not the world mess. It's bad with church folks. <laughs> Y'all praying for me? All right. I'll get there, but I need your prayers. Here they are together, and they all get along, and they don't. You thought church mess just started, it goes back. Abraham tells him, look, there should be no strife between us. We're brethren. You're not my enemy, we're brethren. And there's a way to handle any kind of problem that come up within the confines of people in the church. And I tell you, there come a time. Abraham is right. He said, look, the whole land, verse 9, is before us. We got all this big old world out here. If we can't make it under this roof, then go, do your thing. But you're not going to stay here. And we're not going to fight. Children get like that sometimes, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I'm slow to say amen. amen. Children get that way sometimes. And sometimes the best encouragement you can give to them is go do your thing. Uh -huh. Can't stay here and do it. Amen. With one man in one house, two heads is a, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you. He, he, he said, look, this is what we need to do. You're grown, you're developed, you smell it yourself, whatever it is y'all would say, it's time for you to go. You can't accept what's going on here and walk in some, some unity here. You need to go. He said, the whole land is before us. Separate yourself. You want to go to the left? I'll go to the right. I don't care which way we go, but you're going somewhere if you're not going to stay here and we're going to get along. So the Bible says Abraham is content to go to the left or the right. Why? Because God is with him and he's already promised him wherever the sole of your feet tread on, you're going to be blessed. He has to tell a lot that. God has given the choice. And those of you who know the story, he chose to go in a direction. Lot chose but it wasn't spirit-led. I go my way, he says, but Lot chose. When you choose and not spirit-led, your choice will reflect your heart. His heart was worldly. So his choice 
ran that way. I was shocked. I told my wife, I said, you know, this is interesting to me what I haven't heard from this individual in so long. And now you would send me a message inviting me to some worldliness. And I'm, I'm a Bible man. I'm a spiritual man. I was shocked by that. You know, Lot lifted up his eyes in verse 10. He started looking over the horizon and he said, I'm going to go over in this direction. Sodom was attracted to him. He didn't go there first, but he went toward there. Let me warn every one of you beautiful young people. I got children in this room too. Those of you watching, got you. You go in the direction, it won't be long, you'll get sucked in. You go in the direction of the world, and the world is saying, come on. I know you ain't coming all the way, just take a step more closer. And I'll get you there. Lot chose to go all in the Jordan. Lot in verse 10 lifted up his eyes. Before God coming and dated Solomon and Gomorrah, it looked good. My friend Carl Parker, he's going to be with the Lord now. But he used to say, preach a lesson. Don't let the bright lights fool you or the green grass change your mind. It looked good to him. So he said, I better go over there. He chose it. They separated themselves. Now by the time Abraham is settled, God shows up, gives him a word, gives him a blessing. But the men of Sodom, the Bible said, verse 13, they were wicked. And worldliness, when you're not spiritual and strong, will attract you. It's sure to attract you. How did he get to that place? All because he refused to stay and get along with somebody that was a friend of God. When he went in that direction, the Bible now, we, we read in Peter, Peter viewed him as a righteous man. Here's a righteous man moving in the direction he ought to not go. How loving is God when we move in directions we ought to not go that he would rescue us. Lot, as he's there in Sodom, the land came under attack and the Bible said they took him off in, as a, 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 a casualty of war and when Abraham heard of it, he got a couple of hundred of his best men and went on a rescue mission. You ever did that feature? You ever went on a rescue mission? Yeah. Bail them out of jail, pay their life bill, pay their car note. Right Come on. Yeah. They know so much though, but yet you got to go on a rescue mission. Yeah. <laughs> they get no help there. It's all right, you know. You go on a rescue mission and rescue them from making a complete fool of themselves. Amen. Come on, God. Many times, you know, uh, uh, it, it, well, that's, that's, that's coming up later. He goes and give him and bring him back. Now you would think he would learn from that, but the Bible tells us he goes right back to Sodom and Gomorrah and settled down. He settled down so till they gave him a seat at the gate. You don't just go and sit at the gate. That's another message, but the theology of the gate is that you accept what's going on behind the gate. So they let you sit at the gate as a welcome committee. Welcome to Sodom and Gomorrah. How do you get to the place where you start tolerating the thing that vets you as a righteous man and he saw what was going on in that land? The Bible said he was vexed with it. Look at Peter again, 2 and 8. The Bible said this righteous man dwelling among them, living in the midst of them, watching what they do, seeing it, hearing it. He heard their little activity at night. He heard their little debauchery going on. He saw it with his own eyes. And you and I are living in the midst of it today. You go walking in the store now and it grieves you. And some of them, when they spot Christians, they get more closer to each other, don't they? They want to fall in you like they're going to make you accept it. It still looks sick to me. It makes me want to throw up. It makes me want to just regurgitate whatever in my stomach. It is so sickening to see a man take his lips and put them on another man and come out passion. Ain't nothing passion about that. That is ungodly. That is wicked to the core. And seeing it makes you sick. Hearing it makes you sick. And being in the midst of it makes it sickening. And every time you see it, your heart just go, God, would you please just come now and burn us all. Get us out of this mess. What a mess we're living in. The righteous man dwelling among them don't enjoy what he sees. And as you take your little righteous heart out of this church, and you go to that no-hold-barred job, and you go to that no-hold-barred store, 
You go in that bookstore. You go to transact your little everyday business. There's no doubt you will see in here of the debauchery that America is now welcomed with open arms. Relying. He was vexed with it. Tormented by it. He knew a man don't belong with another man. He knew a woman ought to not be married to another woman. He knew the debauchery of a man taking an innocent little child and shattering all of that innocence. He knew that was wrong. But yet he looked at it and he saw it and he was vexed by it. Many won't cry and talk about it. But when the Bible says he was vexed by it, you have to understand an inductive reasoning in the scripture. He might have lived there, but he was not welcome to the activities that was going on there. And I might live in St. Augustine, in Florida of the United States of America, but I'm not happy with all of the things that they got going on. It's not a pleasing to me to see all of the stuff that they're making legal and celebrating now. It is not welcome to me to see and hear some of the things that you have to see and hear. We were watching a program the other day, and a commercial now. They know how to get to you now. They know you're not going to their channel. They know you're not going to their stuff. So they bring it in the commercial now. They try to get you to accept it. But I don't care how you speak it in on me. It is not right. And the judgment of God is going to fall. And I might be best long enough to get on my face and pray. Nobody knows what my prayer life was like. We're so busy tormenting and criticizing him for living there. But unless somebody is a righteous example of what they are Because your soul is vexed. Your heart is vexed with it. Because you continue to cry. There's a time 
crying. Look at somebody and tell them, don't stop crying. Cry out to God. The wickedness is great. It is exceedingly great before the Lord. But it's time now that the people of God will make known to their God. We're not happy here. We're not happy about what they're doing. I never thought I'd see the day. Two men would make it legal that men would come together. Women would come together. But we're living in last days. And the wickedness of me has escalated to a proportion unlike we never thought. But the more I cry, the more I believe God's going to do something. The more I cry, the more I know the weeping that it does for a night is just a prelude to joy in the morning. Clap your hands. They go, verse 22 says, they go towards Sodom. But Abraham stays in a place of intercession. He's unable to stop when it's sure to come. They go in the city, and you know the story, those of you who have read it. It unfolds, and Lot is confronted with an opportunity to escape. Lot is confronted with an opportunity of a lifetime. Lot is confronted with a chance to get out of here. You've been praying about it. Now it's your time to get out of here. And he said, look, we'll give you a chance to go save somebody else. So the Bible says, Lot in verse 14, he went out. In Genesis 19 and 14, Lot went out and started crying out to his sons-in-law, his daughters. He started crying out to those closest to him. And he said, look, you got to get up out of here. If you want to be saved, you got to come now. You got to come now. You got to leave now. You got to pack your grip and get up out of here now. The judgment is falling. This world is not your home. This is your chance now. God has told me he's going to destroy the city. And I want you to come and go with me. This is our chance. If you want to be saved, you got to come now. You can't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow might not ever be here. This is your last night on earth. This is your last night to get it right. Some left out of their house today. They didn't know this was their last day. You got to come now. You ain't got tomorrow. Tomorrow ain't promised to you. I know some of you young people got all kind of plans and all kind of purposes for which you want to live your life, but you got to come now. You can't play with this thing. I don't know what might happen. You might die in a car accident. Something might happen tomorrow. Somebody might run into you. You can't play games with it. You got to come now while it's an acceptable year. You got to come now while you yet have air in your body. You got to come now while you yet move. Son-in-law 
Two daughters. He still got two in the house. He got daughters now. Folks, this is where I get it all tips up here. I got sons and a daughter. I don't want them to die and go to hell. I want them to come right now. Don't want them to play games with this. My biggest problem is not that they be successful and make a lot of money. That's good. I do want that. But my biggest concern is that they so much right with God. Playing music ain't going to get you into heaven. You can play all day long and make everybody else go there. And you yourself go to hell. But now's the time. You got to hear everybody. Now is the time. The acceptable time. And my problem is why you keep putting it off? Why you acting like you don't know? This is the time. This is the year. This is the hour. This is the acceptable day. You got to choose this day. Don't wait next year. Don't wait next week. This day you got to choose. Who you going to serve? Is it just the Lord? Serve him. If it's God, then come on over here. On the Lord's side. Because over on the Lord's side. Make me mighty happy. Over on the Lord's side. Make me mighty glad. I get joy when I go my home. The next day, Lotus has a problem. He don't want to leave. People he cared about didn't believe the message. People he loved wouldn't hear the message. I don't believe those are the only ones he went to. I believe those are the ones he went to first. But I believe he had friends and acquaintances. Come on, get out of here. Judgment is coming. So what did he do? He lingers as if his prolonging the time is going to stop. In verse 16, the Bible said he lingered. That means he was holding up progress. He was waiting and didn't want to go. He lingered. They said, hold on. If you want to be saved, you can't save those who wouldn't go. But you got to come now. If you're going to be saved, you got to come now. So they took him by the hand. Every indication of this force is that he was reluctant to leave because he didn't want to see the danger come. And if your children don't want to get saved, if your mama don't want to be saved, if your daddy don't want to get saved, what are you going to do? I love you, but I don't want to go to heaven with you. Come down, Lot. I know you've been preaching all this while and nobody listened, but it's time to be saved now. And if you're going to be saved, you've got to come now and save yourself from this unborn generation. He's coming, but he's not coming willingly. They took him by the hand. They grabbed Lot's wife, children. Come on, let's get out of here. They start going. He brought them abroad and said, escape for your life. Look at what's at risk here. It's your life. Look at me. It's your life you're playing with. While you're lingering and playing games, your life is at stake. While you're refusing to come now, your life, Satan is saying, yeah, that's right. Ignore him. Ignore him. Escape for your life. What would a man give in exchange for his life? Escape for your life. Look not behind. What is there to look at? Let's be honest. What's there to look at in your jury pass? A bunch of stuff you don't want to remember, you know it. A bunch of scenes you don't want to revisit. A bunch of avenues you don't even want to ride down again. Them dead end streets. He said, don't you look behind you. Stay in the way. Stay in all plain. Escape. Now, there's a prophetic word here, but a lot of, to the mountain. Go to a higher place than where you are. Go to an elevated place in God that will secure you while you're living in this wicked and perverse generation. Go to a place that only prayer and time and consecration can take you. Hear me now. Escape to the mountain. It's heights of holiness that God was calling them to. It's a place in God that even while you're living here in this mess, you are not affected by it. Escape to the mountain. Get up to a place where that stuff can't 
can't reach you. Get up to a place where that stuff has no relevance for you. But you have decided, for God I live, for God I die. One more time, Lot will experience someone rescuing him. But this time it's not going to be able. It's God who took him by the hand. He took him by the hand and brought him out of the city. And look, the word was, look, you can be saved, but you got to come now. Don't play with it. you got to come now. If you don't come now, there won't be another day. There won't be another opportunity. The fire is coming. The fire is coming, y'all. The fire is coming. Won't be another day. The fire is coming. It's midnight. you got to escape. It's coming. You can look at the signs of the time. It's all among us now. Politically, we're in an unrest. Spiritually, we're in an unrest. Socially, unrest. And now, I mean, this agenda about defund the police is scary. And because so many people are frightened, more people are buying guns. You put a gun in the hand of somebody paranoid, and they're going to be trigger happy. And you think people are dying with no police to protect you. No 911, what's your emergency? Knowing that's a waste of time, people gonna get their own gun and blow your brains out. People gonna get their own gun and protect themselves. We're living in a day, it's coming. It's upon us. In major cities now, the police are retiring and some are quitting, they're finding another job. And now in certain neighborhoods, they will tell you themselves there's no need to call the police. They don't come in this area. Mm -hmm. I got a family member that's a police officer in Tampa. He'll tell you the same thing. He's saying right here. He said there's some areas we'll even go in. That's how bad it's getting. Now Tampa and all these bigger areas are bigger cities, but it's going to trickle down to where you live. And you get behind the gate if you think that's going to keep you safe. The only safety is in the arms of Jesus. The only safety ain't your 45. It's Jesus. Yeah. The reason for such a forceful action is that Lot and his family was really not ready to go. But God was ready for him to go. Don't you see the love of God taking him by the hand? Take him by the hand and drag him out. Lot got out glad he made it out. By the time he get out, the darkness is starting to come. By the time he get out, just as he get out the city, the darkness invades the land. Hell starts showing up on earth. The fire starts falling. The screams. I heard one theologian say, Lot's wife, we don't even know her name. They say she heard the cry of some familiar and turned to go back. They said when she turned to look back, it wasn't that she was looking back. She was actually going back as if she could save those. She could not save them. She had to keep going with the instruction and don't look back. Brother, earlier your mother used to sing that song, Run. Run! Run for your life! Don't look back! God has no pleasure in them! Go back! The reason why we can celebrate Lot's escape is because of the mercy of God. It wasn't him. God took him out of hand and took him out. And one of the most lonely moments he had, my brothers and sisters, is while he was going out with the angel and had him by the hand is that his wife turned and looked back and immediately she turned into a pillow of salt. He couldn't even look back at her. He had to keep moving. If he was going to be saved, he had to keep it moving. You love your wife, you love your husband, you love your children. But man, if they don't want to be saved, you got to keep it moving. I want all my children to be saved. Lord knows I do. I'm so dramatic, they say I'm emotional, supercharged, Nelson, 
crybaby, whatever they want to call me inside, but I want them to be saved. It's nice they play this good music. It's nice they work. They haven't given us serious trouble, but, but, but I want them to be saved. Is that too much to ask? The greatest pause I would have is that they would choose to stay inside. God has given them the opportunity. But you gotta come down. Remember, you're created the days of your youth, not when you get 80. Come down. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. My greatest concern now. That those who have decided to move forward don't get weary and well doing. Lamentation 3 and 22 says, It's of the Lord's mercy we're not consumed. It is of the Lord's mercy. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23, stand with me. It is of the Lord's mercy we're not consumed because His compassions. You can't tell me that wasn't compassion to grab him by the hand. God has extended a hand to some of you today. What you're experiencing today, the Lord is extending you a hand of mercy, a hand of salvation. What must I do to be saved? You got to come to him, but you got to come now. You can't wait. You got to let him fill you with his fire now. You're here. I want to pray for you. It's here. And I want you to understand and know the purposes of God. The purposes of God. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy. Maybe someone's here. They feel like they have all this time. Maybe you feel like you have time. God's convinced now. Don't play with him. Come down. Come down. Surrender your life. Surrender the throne of your life. Give it over to the Lord. Now is the acceptable time. Your salvation is dearer than what you think. Father, I don't want to miss this moment. Perhaps there's someone here or through social media who would say, this is my moment. I can't wait another moment. I might not have another moment like this. No man can come except the Father and draw me. And I feel that drawing. <laughs> draw me to your side. Save me from this untoward generation. Save me from myself before I make a shipwreck of my life. Maybe you hear and you're saying, look, I've confessed him as Lord, but I've walked far from the peaceful shore. I want the Lord to ignite my fire. I want a fresh fire. I want to be able to know without a shadow of a doubt, I am his and he is mine and we are walking together. I want a fresh fire in my life. I want the Lord to renew the spirit within me. Do it for me right now, Lord. Hallelujah. Die for fire, Lord. Come on, sing it with me. I want to burn for you. Consume me, oh Lord. As I cry out for you. Fresh wind, fresh fire, sweep over our souls. And bless you, strengthen us that we might walk it out. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seen. Hallelujah. Consume me. Consume me. Spiritual hunger, 
seem to be a diminishing thing now. People seem to be so excited and caught up in the affair of the life, living their life, doing their life. Folks are no longer hungry for God like they used to be. I don't know what's alarming. The Bible said in the last days it would be this way. The love of many would grow cold. Some are kept even sitting in the house of the Lord. Love grown cold. I mean, it's so cold, you can't even feel any warmth in them. I trust and pray. I pray that you don't let the fire go out. One of the duties of the priest was to make sure the fire don't go out in the temple. You ought to make sure your fire don't go out. He said, Pastor, how do I keep it lit? Right here. On your knees. Have a day of praise. Have a day of celebration. Have some worship. Have some time when you just read his word and meditate on him. Turn off the world. Turn your eyes on him. And the things of this world will go straight to you then. Give God a hand clap. God bless you. Love you. I pray God's this blessing upon you. Many, we believe, that will be with, uh, impacted by the gospel as the word of God come forth. You be blessed. Cherish the moments. Cherish the moments. Because we know not when these moments are going to end. I'm going to pray one more time. You're going to be dismissed. I pray that you have a joyful time of reflection with your family. Have a time where you reflect on this message. Let it get in your spirit. Let it get in your heart. Faith come by hearing and that by the word of God. You can't do it outside of being in the word of God and in prayer. The Lord bless you, keep you. God bless you, those who have joined us through social media and those on YouTube. Uh, my message is getting out. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, heart to heart uh, ministries. The Lord has just taken us. And I thank God for it. I'm humble. And I feel that we're living in an opportunity but we must make the most of that opportunity. You pray for me as I pray for you. That's all I ask. Amen. You pray for me as I pray for you. Let's pray for each other. Let's love one another. And let's reach out to one another. Come on and stand. Father, we are so thankful. You are the refiner. I want to burn for you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will bless your people. Bless these, your servants. I thank you for these young men. Thank you for these women. Thank you for these men of God, these young ladies. Thank you for these young people. Father, I pray and lift them up before you. And I ask in a special way you would minister to their hearts. Those who have heard the word and would intend them to minister to them. Some have decided, I can't wait another day. I'm going to get it right with God. I'm going to get it right. Pray your blessings upon them. Pray that the grace of God, oh Lord, would move in and through their life. Protect your people as they leave from here, not from this place, but from this dwelling, your presence. Father, I pray you would go with them and that you would bless them and keep them. Bless these men and women on their jobs. Give them favor. Give them favor to perform and produce in such a way that they dare not would want to let them go. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give them an opportunity to advance and do your wondrous work in that job, Father, showing your glory, that they might know you and make you known. Thank you we have that opportunity on these jobs and in our family and with these relationships you trust us with. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us words of favor to speak into their lives. Bless your people. Continue to keep us safe. Father, I pray your hand to be upon them. Bless those who have an offering to give. Bless those who would say, I'm going to stand and support the word of God and go forth. And I pray, Father, your blessings upon them. The seed we sow grow out of our present work in the future. Go with us and we'll give you praise. Now we're going to him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before him, the only wise God, to whom be glory, honor, and dominion, and power forever and ever. Everybody love the Lord. Say amen. 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 God bless you.